Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Dr. The Doctor in the chat room. I am Dr. Rhonda Shaw, part of your Dr. The Doctor host. Hey, Dr. West, there's the other half. Yes, ma'am. How you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing really well. You know, I got to kind of plug my Buffalo Bills because we are oh, doing <laughs> we are doing it this season and I'm so proud of them and I'm yeah. so excited. Yeah. yeah, your Cowboys ain't doing too bad neither. They didn't do too bad the other day, but we'll just wait and see, all right? <laughs> yes, yes. We'll wait and yes. see what happens with that. We hope you guys are staying safe. And as always, we appreciate you coming back each Saturday uh, at this hour to spend this time with us, because as we always say, we cannot do this without you. We have a very special guest today, and uh, we're going to bring her on in a moment. Uh, Dr. West, how about you do that? All right. So I'm really excited about <clears throat> our guest today. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh -huh. um, so her first name is Winsome, and she is a multi-published model with runway, commercial, editorial, ad, and print training. Uh, she is an Amazon-ranked best-selling author of Mind Blown, so she's going to tell us a little bit about that today. Mm -hmm. um, she's an avid public speaker, an active humanitarian, and has been for over 30 years. Wow. Um, Winsome was born on the beautiful island of Jamaica and raised in Queens, New York. Uh, during her many tenures as a family member, student, uh, divorcee, friend, confidant, humanitarian, and frontline employee, she remained thankful to the Lord above. Uh, the degrees, her double minor, certificates, awards, medals, all right now, and other accolades led her to uh, adding to this body of, of work. Um Winsome has traveled half of the U.S. Uh, to the Caribbean, Germany, France, all over North America, and she plans to expand this uh, book to a spinoff series um, of each character, and I'm really, really excited to talk to her today to uh, learn more about everything we we just I just briefly mentioned. So welcome to the show, Miss Winston. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And let me just say before before we go any further, let me just say I was fortunate to um, hear her mm -hmm. uh, on an interview with Miss Pamela Marshall. Uh, Pamela uh, was a or is a very well known. Um, uh, newscaster and and uh -huh. much more former newscaster in the West Tennessee area. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she is she is currently in Florida uh, cool. as with uh, Miss Bentley. But um, in the past, she you know when people hear Pamela Marshall Marshall, they're gonna remember her uh, mm -hmm. from TV here in the West Tennessee area. Okay, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for being with us today. How are you? Hi, ladies. Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. Good. Glad so you. Listen, you have a uh, full resume of accomplishments. <laughs> um, the one I kind of want to start with is your runway uh, modeling career. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got into it and what that whole world is like? Ooh, okay, sure. So I'm a published plus size model. So a lot of people um, are not too, too in depth with plus size modeling. So the best way I can describe it is society mm -hmm. believes anything above a size 12 is plus size. So any double digit number wow. above 10 or 12 is considered plus size. Mm -hmm. um, it was an area that wasn't really tapped into many years ago, but now there's definitely a platform and, a, and a, mm -hmm. an area for it. So I thought of being a model when I was much younger, much slimmer, <laughs> you okay. know, and things like that. But I don't know if you or any of the listeners have ever experienced it where you had a dream when you were younger and maybe you shared it with like a family member or someone and they kind of dissuade you from the yeah. dream. Like, oh, you need to be a lawyer or a doctor. Like, uh -huh. what's, what's that? You know, that kind of thing. So sure. it's, it's more like a dream deferred or got mm -hmm. delayed. 
So um, about a year ago, I was prepping for my birthday and the makeup artist that does my face for my birthdays in different events actually suggested that I get into modeling. She's like, I love your look. Your skin is smooth. You have great personality. You definitely have the curves. And I just really think you'd be great. I was like, me? Because again, this is 30 years ago that I uh-huh. thought of it. I, I kind of just put it out my mind. I didn't really think about it anymore. Mm-hmm. She's like, well, try it out. You know, I know someone that I could connect you with. Why don't you just try it and see how it goes? Yeah. And I did that. Um, I connected with that person who initially gave me some insight, but I actually took the baton and ran with it. I learned so much. I connected, I networked, and Mm -hmm. that has led to different fashion designers asking me to walk um, different runways for them multiple times. Um, I was invited to New York Fashion Week. I've done photo shoots in New York, New Jersey, Atlanta, Florida, um, I was going to do uh, an international show, but there was a personal conflict with my time. So I wasn't able to do that. So I'm looking to expand and get into that as well. So I took a break over the holidays and now I am actually starting again to get back into plus size modeling. So I have uh, a show coming up uh, this Sunday and two next month and they continue to roll in as the year goes on some shows are back to back to back weekend so you have to have the time you have to have the energy you have to have the look you know many people think it's easy because they see you know the pictures the posing the walks the turns things like that it's fun don't get me wrong and when you look good you feel good but it is a ton It's a ton of prep work. It's a ton of prep work, you know, um, depending on who the designer is, they might want your hair, you know, a certain way. Most, most, um, pardon me. Yeah. Yes. Most Mm -hmm. designers, uh, they give you uh, kind of a rundown of what they're looking for because it's their clothes and they want you to model it in order for the consumers to buy it Uh so they you know they're looking for a certain flair if they want you to tone it tone it down or or turn it up you Uh know um they might want your hair up in a ponytail versus uh you know the short haircut that I have now Uh some like uh you know fierce colors on your face for makeup you know like the theatrical carnival you Uh know and some just want smoky eye and lip gloss, you know, things like that. So you just have to know what the fashion designer's vision is for you and for their clothing so that you can represent it the same way. I've done African designs. I've Mm -hmm. done uh, Hispanic designs. I've done Caribbean designs. I've done American designs. I'm Mm -hmm. multi-talented, multifaceted. I enjoy what I do. um, And there's various amounts of positive that come from it the networking um different forms of payment and Mm -hmm. the ability to travel and the ability to be connected in different spaces that I was not able able to do before and I've met some really great people acclimated to all of that like you know not having done any of that right but processing and wrapping your brain around um all the different things that come with it and the different uh, desires that the different agencies or whomever want, like Mm -hmm. you just kind of went into that and just kind of flowed with it, huh? Well, thank God for me, two things helped me out. One, Mm -hmm. I've always had a skill Mm -hmm. of being uh, multi-talented in the area of organization and time management. That's always been a skill of mine. So Uh those things really help me. I'm also a quick learner. So when I'm learning things and I'm networking, I have the ability to retain it. And a lot of times I write things down, but it's about practice. It's about putting in the energy and the effort. It's about training. Training is super important. So initially the person that I connected with gave me some basic initial training, Mm -hmm. but I learned so much from taking classes and, you know, connecting with other models who have been in Mm. the arena a lot Mm -hmm. longer. So I've learned from a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I heard you say when you started this, and I and I don't want us to get into our our the meat of our our uh, discussion today in a moment, but I heard you say that someone told you, kind of dissuade you early on. What would you say to any young girl, uh, particularly young black girls that say, I want to do this. I want to model. I want to, you know, whatever it is. What, what, what would be your advice to those girls? My advice would, my advice to anyone would be learn, learn, learn. And the three ways that you would learn is one, actually see if you can get some kind of internship, some kind of training, some kind of insight. If you happen to know someone that works in that area, because that behind the scenes knowledge is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second thing I would advise them to learn about is understanding how that arena works. For Mm -hmm. example, sometimes you'll get free clothes or discounted clothes. Sometimes you'll get payment in the form of they'll pay for your hotel accommodations or Mm -hmm. your travel Mm -hmm. or or financial, you know, Mm -hmm. so there's, there should be no preconceived notions. Don't go in thinking, okay, yes, I'm going to be um, in Milan or in Paris and I'm going to be paid thousands of dollars. Don't go in with any preconceived notions, go in Mm -hmm. with an open mind. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I would advise anyone who's interested in doing it is make sure it's a passion, make sure it's something that you actually like to do. No one wants to spend their time doing something that they don't really like. So Mm -hmm. if it's something that you're curious in, is it just curiosity or is it curiosity with a little urge and a little burn to it? And yes, I'm willing to put in the work because I feel like it could be life-changing. You know, those things, I would just definitely encourage them to follow your passion. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you said that because, you know, we just celebrated Dr. King's um, birthday, right? And someone was saying the other day that we are a culture that talks a lot about following your dreams, Mm -hmm. but not many people really do, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us, most of us sometimes look at, you know, what's more feasible, like what's going to make the most money. You know, it's not like, what do I really wake up every day? And I, I love so much and I would want to do this every day, Mm -hmm. right? For the rest of my career or my life or whatever, I spend my life doing this. Most of the time it ends up being like, well, I know I really like this, but I can't make that much money doing this, or it may be a slow process. So, you know, I hope, I hope that young people will learn to do what you said. Love what you do, like follow your dreams, go after it. Um, so, you know, you've written a book and we're going to get into the book, but, um, I want to get into the meat of why we ask you to be here today for this interview. Okay. <laughs> um, because I personally feel like parents have an obligation to foster um, identity formation in their in their children. I feel like that okay. is a responsibility of parents. And that's my personal opinion. Um, okay. But with feeling that way and, and kind of knowing your the background and your story um i I say let's start with the background let's just lay the foundation and then we're going to build on it okay so just give me the foundational piece of your story okay so transitioning and it's actually intermixed with the modeling so Mm -hmm. i just want let me uh just wrap up a finite point about the modeling modeling is um fashion shows. It is photo shoots. It Mm -hmm. is uh, the networking and the behind the scenes and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So having, like I said, time management and having the time to actually manage Mm -hmm. is very, very important. And that's a segue into my book. So Mm -hmm. Mind Blown is a book that, Mind Blown is a book that actually was written. It was loosely, it's a loosely based fictionalized version of what actually happened uh, in my life. So the basis of it is about two years ago, I took an ancestry DNA test only to find out that my father is not my father. And my real father, who is someone pretty well known and very well respected, um, one, 
had been murdered. So I never got a chance to meet him. And two, the levels of lies and manipulation that went into covering up Mm -hmm. this story um, is actually what um, led me to writing this book. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were how old when you found out who your real father is? It was about two years ago. So yesterday was my birthday. So I just turned 46. So I was 44 when it happened. Okay. Um, and this is, this is such a familiar story, right? It's just that, you know, in families, Mm -hmm. but what's not so familiar is finding someone that decided to put, you know, pen to paper indeed, and share it with the world. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. um, we have a few minutes to break, but I want to, I want to just start with, um, what led you to finding out that who you thought was your father wasn't your father? How did you even begin this venture to find in finding your father? Because that's not what you were you were actually doing. You weren't looking for your father. <laughs> I, I I didn't even know I had a paternity issue in yeah, the first right. place. I, mm-hmm. I I was not aware of that. Nothing mm-hmm. growing up spark that you Mm -hmm. know there was there were no conversations that Mm -hmm. no whispering I I didn't know Mm -hmm. um we uh during the the middle of the pandemic you know my family that I had growing up my paternal family uh decided that they wanted to have a family reunion because COVID was kind of breaking um it was during the summertime and you know the kids were out of school so they figured okay, if they do like an Airbnb, a big open space, you know, if everyone wears masks, COVID numbers were going down, maybe we could have like a family reunion and everyone had uh, something to do. My portion that I offered to do was to do a family tree. Mm -hmm. And that is actually how it came up because Mm -hmm. I don't know about anyone else, but sometimes you kind of hear stories and folklores about who your ancestors are. Oh, well, auntie this and uncle this, but you do you truly know you know so I was very curious Mm -hmm. um so the grandparents I had growing up thank god they answered some of my questions but it wasn't enough so I decided I would create a family tree and issue it out to everyone as like a token and like a remembrance of the family reunion so everyone can take it you know kind of put it up in your house your children can see it know their legacy and things of that nature Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Really good stopping point. We are at break. We're going to go to break and we're going to come back in a moment uh, with Winsome Bentley and we're going to build on this story because it is an amazing story. And we will be right back on Doctor to Doctor in the chat room right here on 94.7 FM in just a moment. We'll be back. And we are back on 94.7 FM. We are talking to Ms. Winsome Bentley. Uh, she's sharing her story about finding her father, her, her real father, after 44 years. Um, and so you talked about how you you were, you did this ancestry, you attempted to do this ancestry test. Um, but one of the interesting things, too, was your relationship with the father that you thought was your father. That was a pretty strained relationship, right? Correct. Um, And have you since figured out, you know, have you said anything like, oh, no wonder, or, (laughs) you know, like, no wonder it was strained. Um, I've had a variety of different thoughts go through my head. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I have not had a conversation with him. Uh, He and I already did not have uh, communication prior to mm-hmm. this test. Mm-hmm. So it it was, it, it didn't change anything for me. Mm-hmm. Um, however, his brother, which is my 
I guess, pseudo uncle, for lack mm -hmm. of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's more of who the father figure was in my life. And that's who I remain in contact with. And that's actually who broke the news to him, to his mm -hmm. brother. Mm -hmm. So my uncle, who is also in the book, was al almost like a buffer. He's very protective, uh, very loving, very spiritual, one of the best men I know. So um, he had that conversation with him, but I personally did not have any conversations with him. Mm hmm um, so let's start back. Let's go back to the ancestry test. So you're, you're doing this test and your, your intentions are to find out more about your family's background and you're going to share this information with other family members, uh, as a gift. So, Absolutely. So let's start there. So what happens? You do the test and what happens? So it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't equal a test at first. I wanted to do the family history and um, I started on my own and I started running into some roadblocks because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work to try to find information, especially if you're a novice, someone new to it, you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I was a novice. I wasn't familiar with what it took. Mm -hmm. Um, the second portion that really was uh, a hindrance is, and you'll hear my accent come back and forth. I was born in Jamaica. So mm -hmm. to be in the U.S., but try to access records from another country, a small island, a vital country at that. But I did not know where to start or where to go and things of that nature. So I realized I needed additional help. And one night I saw the commercial for Ancestry and they had a show called Who Do You Think You Are? Mm -hmm. And it's based on tracing ancestral roots. I said, well, that's what I'm doing. Hmm. I wonder mm -hmm. if they can help me. It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. So I called, spoke to their representative and they made me aware that they have, yes, the regular DNA test, but they also have like a family research project where mm -hmm. if you pay for it, they can actually assign you a genealogist who will hold your hand, walk you through it and actually help do the family tree, the research and everything, okay. create a whole collage, you know, get access to information, pictures, and then create like this whole report for mm -hmm. you. It's like a real family history project. Now it's a bit, pricey but I was I felt it was an investment mm -hmm. and I didn't ask anyone for help that's how we ended up doing that because when I did pay for the project to be done and I figured okay this gentleman will help me to get to where I need to be uh he was able to find my mother's family roots mm -hmm. all the way up to the 1700s, like 1799. Wow. Yes. I mean, tons of information. And the part of Jamaica I'm from, it uh, is the parish of St. Mary. So Jamaica has parishes and it's only 14 mm -hmm. parishes. So I'm from the parish of St. Mary. So he was able to, you know, track my family and see when we first arrived there and what plantations we were on and different mm -hmm. things like that. Just keen information mm -hmm. however he started running into some issues with my paternal side and that's actually what ended up that's actually what ended up causing an mm -hmm. issue he was running into issues with my paternal side he said that he was running into roadblocks um names were not matching up uh items were missing documents couldn't be found mm -hmm. people were adopted just a, a variety of different things mm -hmm. so I was like, well, you found my mother's. How come you can't find my father? I didn't even yeah. think anything of it. So yeah. the genealogist is the one that suggested I do a DNA test. So when he first said it, I said, why would I need to do a DNA test? Because in my mind, I'm looking for my ancestors. I'm not looking for anything on me. So why do you need me to do mm -hmm. a DNA test? That doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what I've learned is it, when you do a DNA test, Sometimes you're able to connect with different people that are already in our database. And yes. that actually opens up uh, a lot of unknown information and connect dots to things that we didn't know. And that is actually what helps to build your family tree. So for example, 
if I was related to one of you ladies, your dad could have been my uncle and mm -hmm. I may not have been aware of that. So once your family tree is there and it connects me genealogically to your mm -hmm. uncle, I'm now able to say, oh, wow, that's my uncle. And mm -hmm. I can add to the tree that way. So he kind of suggested that as a way to open up the, the family tree and to gain answers. So that's how the DNA test came around. It was suggested by the genealogist. Wow. Okay. Can I ask how uh, shocking or um, what was going through your mind? I know you said when he suggested the DNA test, you were like, what, why, how related, you know, what does that have to do with anything? When you actually found out, um, how did you react? What was that like for you? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll never forget. So it was on a Zoom call. And um, so both sides of my family have a family group chat that I'm in. So I'm a very transparent person. So both sides of the family knew I was doing the mm -hmm. family tree, even though it's for the, the paternal side, but I did let the maternal side kind of know what I'm doing. Hey guys, mm -hmm. you know, I'm interested in doing this. So um, when the genealogist suggested it, I happened to, you know, just tell the family. So my uncle, the pseudo uncle from my paternal side, and then my youngest maternal aunt on my mother's side, both of them were like, hmm, that's actually pretty interesting. We don't know a lot about our family. Mm -hmm. I'm actually interested in this winsome. Keep me updated and let me know how it's going. So they kind of followed my story, followed my path. And um, when I told them about the DNA test, uh, they also were like, well, what do you need a DNA test for? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. So the genealogist suggested that I do a DNA test, but because he couldn't find anything on my father's side, he asked, do I think my father would be willing to do a DNA test? Because his DNA is actually what we would need to kind of help open up that side of the family tree. So, I did make So you're saying nobody in your family on your mom's side or your dad's side had ever even questioned father was that was my knowledge at that time mm -hmm. until until later on mm -hmm. um i which i was going to get to that part but okay. late, later okay. later on uh one of my cousins uh did kind of tap my shoulder mm -hmm. and was like hey um you know auntie whatever her name is Mm -hmm. You know, she made a she made a comment the other day, and I just thought it was strange. So I said, "What comment is that?" And he said, "Well, that's not my brother's that's that's not my brother's daughter anyway, or that's not my my niece anyway." But it was during the time of when this was going on, and I don't get along with my father or that aunt, which is his sister. So okay. to me, when people in families don't get along, they say hurtful things. They mm -hmm. go below the belt. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think anything of it because again, nothing in my growing up ever right. made me feel. So when you say something below the belt, I just think you're being nasty. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put any stock into it. So that was the only thing that kind of came up. But myself and my cousin both kind of just shrugged our shoulders I did bring it up to my mother at the time she was like oh you know how they are I don't listen to them that kind of thing so nothing made me feed into it but that was the mm -hmm. only thing okay okay so you're you're doing the test some problems come up who how do you end up getting the DNA that you need to determine who's who so uh, first things first, uh, he suggested that I get a DNA sample from the father's side in order to open up that side. I told him it's a no go for me mm -hmm. because I don't I'm not in communication with my father at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. However, remember, his brother, my pseudo uncle, is uh, the father figure in my life and also was encouraging of me to do this. So mm -hmm. he said, well, Winsome. Why don't I do it? So my uncle mm -hmm. suggested it. He was like, I have the same mother and the mm -hmm. same father. We're, we're full siblings. I have the same mm -hmm. mother and father as your dad. He's like, don't worry about your dad. If he don't want to do it, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. He's like, 
because he wanted to help support me because he himself was interested in learning about our family history. We don't have any information beyond our grandparents. We don't know anything. So mm -hmm. my uncle is the one that suggested it. Mm -hmm. So when the test results came back, the genealogist sent out um, an email and said, hey, Winsome, I need to meet with you and your uncle. Can we set up a Zoom? I set up a Zoom. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, yes. Oh, my God. He has some information. Finally, because, you know, he didn't have any information before. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so we sat on the Zoom and the genealogist said, well, I'm just going to come out and say it. He was like, uh, Winsome, this is not your uncle. He wow. said, he said, this is not your uncle. I don't know if you or anyone in the audience have ever had like an out of body experience. It is a very surreal feeling because I thought I heard him, but I was like, you know, your brain processes it. I'm like, oh, maybe I heard him wrong. So I said, excuse me, sir. Maybe I heard you wrong. I, I was waiting to hear the DNA test results, but I don't know. I thought you said that that's not my uncle, but I'm sure that's not what you said. Can you tell me, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on? So my brain is trying to make sense of what mm -hmm. he's saying. So he sat there very stoic, very professional. I have to give it to Ancestry. He's mm -hmm. very professional. <laughs> and he said, no, you heard me correctly. He said, um, that's not your uncle. He said, the DNA doesn't match. So my uncle now... And remember, we're from the Caribbean. So my uncle, even though he's the man of the cloth, and he was like, what? What do you mean? What are you talking about? He's like, no, 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 no. I don't know what kind of backdoor science project mm -hmm. foolishness y'all mm -hmm. got going on, but you better run that test again. That's my niece. What are you talking about? I've changed her diapers and been playing mm -hmm. with her for 44 years. What you mean? He was like, that's my niece. You better run that test again. He was like, I don't want to hear none of that. You better run that test again. And don't mess up this time. So my uncle kind of like, you know, got into him. And again, very professional, you know, the genealogist from Ancestry. And he said, no problem. He said, I will go ahead and run it again for both of you. But let me suggest three options that I think would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of quiet now because it's slowly starting to sink processing. in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So my uncle, my uncle and him are going back and forth, but I'm just on the Zoom trying to make sense of what I heard, but right. it doesn't make sense to me. So he said, Well, listen, I've been doing this for double digit years. And in my experience, the only time when situations like this happen is one of three things. So in order for us to find out what's really going on, let me have you consider this. He said, for example, this is science. It's mm -hmm. genetics. You mm -hmm. cannot manipulate mm -hmm. genetics. You cannot manipulate science. Mm -hmm. You know, one plus one equals two. It doesn't equal 11 because you mm -hmm. line the one up next to the other one. Mm -hmm. You know, it might seem like 11 because you line the ones up, but it equals two. So he said, these are the three possibilities that I think could be going on. Mm -hmm. He said, one, either when some was switched at birth. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, who was stealing babies in the Caribbean in the seventies? You know, <laughs> like, but you can't put anything. I mean, people were, they didn't have wristbands at the yeah. hospital then. So mm -hmm. it's possible. Right. So he said that was an option Two, He said, well, Winsome's father is not her father. We kind of just threw that to the side, me and my uncle, because mm -hmm. again, we had no reason to think that that was the case. So we kind of just put that to the side. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, what else you got? What's next? Mm -hmm. And the third option he gave, he said, well, uncle, you are adopted. And that's why your DNA doesn't match Winsome. Oh. That could be her father, but you and her father are not siblings because you're adopted. So right. that's why your DNA doesn't match. So those were the three options he gave us. Mm -hmm. So now that we had those three options on the table, the genealogist says we have to do a process of elimination. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out which one is this. So mm -hmm. this has become something more than what it was meant to be. Because again, I'm simply trying to create a family tree. This is what? all I wanted. I wanted the history 
so I can present it to the grandchildren and they can mm -hmm. present it to their children. And it's a legacy. You, you, you make it for the generation going forward. I never once thought in my wildest dreams that this would become what it became. Mm -hmm. So the genealogist suggested that in order for us to figure out how we can uh, eliminate each, he said for the first one, if I was actually stolen from my mom or switched at birth, I would have to have a DNA test done with my mother. We have to find out, am I even hers? Is she really my mother? That would um, prove if I was switched or not. So that was okay. the first situation. Mm -hmm. The second one, he said, um, I would have to get a DNA test sample from one of my siblings that I share with my father and we can compare it to see if we share the same father. And then of course, that would also lead into you know, my uncles, because they could compare it to my uncles as well. Mm -hmm. So I kind of put the first, su first suggestion to the side. I didn't want to bother my mother because her mother was actually in the final stages of life at that time. And I'm not a selfish person. She's in the midst of losing her mother, my grandmother, both of us. I just didn't think it was fair to bother her with that mm -hmm. at that time. So I just said, okay, well, you know, let me go ask one of my siblings. Again, didn't think anything of it. Suggested it to one of my younger sisters. She said, yes. She was like, sis, do I have to give blood or take needles and inject? You know, I don't do injections. I said, no, it's just a simple swab. It's a saliva mm -hmm. swab. And she was like, oh, that's nothing. So she did it. We sent it in and the genealogist put a rush on it. The test results came back and <laughs> Lord, let me tell you, I can chuckle now, but it was so heart rendering to go through this. So the test results came back and again, he set up another Zoom and the genealogist says, Winsome, your sister's and your uncle's DNA match but neither one of them match with you. Oh my goodness. So that was how the realization came out because again, their DNA is matched. So they're in the right family tree. They are connected. They are related. I'm the odd man out. I'm what? the one that doesn't match with any of them. Mm -hmm. I want to get your reaction to this on, on the other side. We have come up to a break, but I, this is just, I mean, you couldn't probably write a more crazy story. Um, let's get your reaction to all of this on the other side. Uh, we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. We're back on Dr. to Doctor in the chat room. We have Miss Winsome with us today and she has been telling us a about a very, very interesting um, part of her story. Um, so before we went to break, you, Winsome, you were telling us about how you basically found out that your your not your dad and I wanted to come back to break with you talking to us about how you reacted when you heard this information. Um, tell us, tell us a little bit about you know what your reaction was like, and and the rest of your family too. Yeah, because I mean your your mom, um, mm. your dad that's not your dad. You know, they're the people that didn't know you were their family. Mm -hmm. There's there are so many moving moving parts, right? There's a lot of layers. There's mm -hmm. a lot of layers. Um, mm -hmm. to and and I peeled back each and every one. I peeled mm -hmm. back each and every one, mm -hmm. and that I'm I'm in now in hindsight, almost two years later, I'm feeling like that is um, uh, I'm not gonna say resentment, but that is the initial feeling that they had as if. Oh, why, why are you doing this? And, you know, so let me start with the questions that you asked. What was the family's reaction? There was a mixed reaction because I'm from a big family. 
on both sides. So there was mixed reactions. Remember I told you about the maternal aunt or the paternal uncle. So those were the supportive ones. Mm -hmm. You know, I had cousins that were curious. So they had more questions and, oh, tell me this. Then there were some family members, hands off, neutral, like Switzerland, didn't have anything to say. They just went right down the middle. Mm -hmm. And some were like, well, why are you doing this? What's the purpose? Okay, it's 44 years later. What what even made you? Decide? So there was a, a plethora of reactions from a variety of people. Um, my personal reaction. So shock, confusion, bewilderment, um, anger. Uh, you said on your interview with uh, Pamela that you were able to take back some of your power and control um, and right some of the wrongs. Um, what do you mean by that? So when this story came out, it was very clear to me as things started to unfold that there was a lot of lies and manipulation that mm -hmm. uh, was mm -hmm. done back then. Mm -hmm. Those things were outside of my control. Those things were done mm -hmm. when either I was in embryo or as a child. So sure. I did not have the opportunity to create a, a space or a setting for anything. And I felt like people played God with my life and they are not my God. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I am in a stage now where I am able to control certain settings and certain space. The people that are in my cipher are there because of, you know, mm -hmm. choices and reason. Mm -hmm. However, because of the many lies and manipulation that happened, I decided I'm going to write the truth. You're not going to tell my story. You're not going to keep mm -hmm. adding to the lies. You're not going to sweep it under the rug. You're not going to tell your version. You're not going to run ahead of me and tell the story because we all know whoever gets to the ears first, that, yeah. that you know what I mean? That, that yeah. soft landing mm -hmm. is what hits home. Everybody else is just clean up and, and, and try to, you know, do PR at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing yeah. that. This is my life. This is yeah. my life. Mm -hmm. This shook me. This shattered me. This changed me irreparably, yeah. irreparably. So I felt like a lot of people couldn't grasp that concept because it wasn't happening to them. And mm -hmm. no matter how much you, you cried, you explained, you hoped for some empathy, they can only give as much as what they have. Some right. of them had, some of them had nil, nothing. Mm -hmm. Some, some of them had some, and some had a lot more. So I was able to, um, put what I consider my life back on track and back on course in my way, mm -hmm. um, that was truthful. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was also showing people you, uh, you know, this ain't bad. This ain't that. You you can't control me or my life anymore or anything else. I'm not giving you that opportunity. And one of the one of the ways I decided to do it was to document it here um, in my book, Mind Blow. Was right. How, how have you? What have you found? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Doctor West. No, no, no. You're fine. Go ahead. What What have you found? Um, how have you found it to be helpful to others? You know, because like I said, this is a familiar story. It is. But what's is. different is that you put pen to paper and you documented it in your book. Yes. So I'm sure people have read your book mm -hmm. and you've you've you're learning how it's probably helping other people to start to peel back layers and come to terms. A ton. A ton. I have had people uh, write me on social media mm -hmm. in comments, in posts. Wow, this is my story. Oh my God, I feel like you're my twin. Mm -hmm. You're writing about me. This mm -hmm. is that. I've also received emails, mm -hmm. um, text messages, letters. Wow, you inspire me. Because of you, I went and did a DNA test. Or You, you know this takes courage, right? You do know that, right? Do you know that uh, the reason a lot of people, they may not be writers and, and, and you know, and put it in a book, 
but people don't talk about it because, you know, sweeping the things underneath the rug is the way, mm -hmm. you know, you know what I mean? That is true. Go ahead, Dr. West. I apologize. Yeah. I was just wondering if how therapeutic this was for you to mm. not only document your story, but to have other people come and say, you know, thank you for doing this, or you gave me the courage. Like, how how therapeutic has this part of the journey been for you? Um, it became therapeutic later on, but initially, I was unaware that I was even inspiring lives. I was just simply speaking on my story. I was just simply documenting my journey, and I wanted to tell the truth for the world and not have someone else tell the truth because they are a liar. So uh, that is actually what I initially started. I had no idea that it would inspire so many people. I know off the top of my head, at least 17 people that did DNA tests in my circle, in my mm. cipher, but I've had people from other countries and different people that have emailed me and things like that saying that they have done it. Now I do know some people that have done it, without speaking, like without telling me, but I've heard of it through other realms and things like that. So it has affected a lot of people. A lot of people are now having conversations with family or bringing up things that they may have heard or whispers that may have gone and been shunned later on. It's actually bringing this conversation to the front. And what has really been the repetitive core concept that has been exposed is that this is a lot more normalized than we realize. This has been happening for eons. This, eons. I'm not the first. Yeah. I'm not the first. No, I'm not the first. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the last, but at the same time, it was just something that was shunned. It was taboo. Oh, we don't talk about it, but this happens very regularly and some people are either uncomfortable with rocking the boat they like their life the way it is they don't want anything to change some are uncertain because they may not have all the pieces to the puzzle some are certain but are afraid and then others like me who just blaze ahead so mm -hmm. you know changed your or changed you and your mom's relationship in any way absolutely it 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 disintegrated oh, it disintegrated God. it's it's at nil and it's still at nil um when i <laughs> so if you remember um when this at first came out i shared with you that my grandmother which is her mother was in the final stages of life uh -huh. so i didn't say anything. I didn't bring anything up. That's me being unselfish. That's who I am. So maybe four or five days had passed and um, my mother reached out to me and she said, I haven't heard from you in a few days. Usually you and I talk, we text, whatever the kids, what's going on with you? I said, I'm going through something right now, but I don't want to bother you with it because you're, you're going through something with your mom. And she was like, there's nothing we can do. We're not doctors. We're not God. We're not life. We can't do anything for her. So because we can't do anything for her, there's nothing I can do. So go ahead and tell me what's going on. I was like, are you sure? And she said, yes. So I told her, I told her every single thing. And I waited, I waited, I waited for an answer, for an explanation Mm. For, for a hug, for a, I'm sorry, for something that anyone would think would be a normal reaction of a parent to a child that mm -hmm. put the child in that situation. And none of that came. Mm -hmm. None of that came. And that's the part that I will never forget. And as I sat and looked at her, it's almost like she... I don't know. She looked at me, but it's like she looked through me and mm. you know, her reaction was none. And she was like, well, if that's not your father, then who is? And I'm sitting here looking at her like, lady, that's a question for me to ask you. What do you mean? Like, I'm the child. What do you mean? Like, why would you answer a question with a question? Mm. People that do that are either stalling 
or Mm -hmm. being manipulative. And I don't like either one, you know, like I'm a parent. So I feel like when your child is showing you a form of distress, yeah. Why can't why can't that be your priority? Why can't you focus on that? Instead, you want to be elusive. You want to be aloof. Because I think sometimes when, you know, if you are accountable for your actions, then, mm. you know, shame comes with that. Mm. And I think that's the part that many people don't want to deal with is the shame. And thus the reason why too many times, like I said, this is such a familiar story, right? People just go along to get along and people whisper and people do all these other things, everything, but, you know, just be accountable and tell the truth. And, you know, because uh, the Bible even says the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the truth trumps everything. Yeah. So that's a fair statement, but let's break it down into the bare basic concept. Mm -hmm. I'm a child Mm -hmm. who was put in a situation based Mm -hmm. on poor Mm decision-making of adults who were entrusted with my care. That's Mm -hmm. the basic, that's as bare as it gets. Mm -hmm. And then let's add to that layer. Let's add to the layer of now that it's been brought to your attention, you're dismissive. Yeah. You're al- you're so aloof. that's the part I'm talking about is dismissive because they don't want to deal with the shame. Yeah. And I'm in it's, no way uh, defending that. I just know it to be a fact. People don't like being shamed. <laughs> no, this is, this is what I have to say about that. Doc, no, first of all, I didn't even know I had a paternity issue. So no one is coming from an angle of, hey, I'm trying to shame you. Hey, I'm yeah. trying. that's the problem. Being caught up in your own personal wants and needs and trumping your child's care, your child's wants, your child's needs. That is selfish. Mm-hmm. That is selfish. You put a person in a situation. The person is now coming to you saying, hey, this position that you put me in has hurt me, changed my life. I'm confused. I need help. I need answers. And you sit there knowing you bore this child Mm -hmm. and you just, for lack of a better term, don't give a damn. Yeah. Nothing in your actions, nothing in your words screamed maternity. Nothing said, I'm sorry. I'm in remorse. Uh, how can I help? Uh, yeah. where do we go from here? I yeah. would have accepted any of those. Mm-hmm. I would have taken any of those, but to sit there and answer a question with a question. And then let me tell you the part that really burned me. The part that just, I can't get past mm-hmm. when I'm asking questions, because now I need to know what's going on. Sure. Everything is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I'm saying to myself, which I in turn said to her, so if you don't know, then who does? Because Mm -hmm. I clearly did not even know that there was something to know. Because your biological father is deceased, right? Is that right? Yes. So what I was... You couldn't ask him. Yeah. Correct. So what I was going to say is when I started asking questions to get to the answers Mm -hmm. of that, Mm -hmm. because everything was, I don't know. I started to become irritated because no one likes to feel like people are, you know, pulling their strings like a puppet. Mm -hmm. So I said to her, well, if you don't know, okay, I'm at a crossroads. Where do I go from here? Mm -hmm. She now says, well, you know, I can ask, and let's just use a a, a term. Um, Let's ask Jane Doe. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, Jane Doe, your friend that you've known since I was a kid? Yes. Well, why would Jane Doe know and you don't know? Mm-hmm. Well, they were engaged and they lived together. So I'm like, wait, so you slept with your friend's fiance? No, 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 no. Um, I was with him before her. I just didn't say anything because we were sneaking around and things like that. So it's just a whole bunch of manipulation. But the part that I'm really getting to is when I asked her to call this Jane Doe to speak on it, Jane Doe knew the information, but Jane Doe was like, 
why are you asking me this about a person from 45 years ago? And I watched my mother sit there and lie to Jane Doe, the same friend that she's known. She didn't uh-huh. tell her the reason she was calling. She All she did was like, oh, girl, <laughs> let's go down memory lane. Oh, my God. Do you remember back when we used to? So she played it off to get answers. And that showed me that you would lie to anybody for uh-huh. any reason at any time. And that's where I lost respect for her. You don't give a damn about uh-huh. anybody. You are focused on images and how you look and how you come off to people. So you're willing to lie to your friend who you've known since before I was born. So clearly you don't have a problem lying to me. And that is what turned me off. So we're, we're, we're at the end of the show, but I got two quick questions. Okay. Number one, um, did you find out from your new, you know, learning about your new siblings that there are a lot of similarities that you have with your dad? Absolutely. Yes. We're in the same field. Um, I look like his sisters. Um, even one of my aunts shared something that I do with my legs. She said, my dad used to do. Yes. I, yeah. I've come across. I think it's amazing how kids don't have to be around their parents and they can still just. Do. Um, the other thing is tell us where we can get your book right quick, the name and yes. where we can get it. Okay. So my book is ranked as a bestseller on Amazon. So it's called Mind Blown, M-I-N-D-B-L-O-W-N. It has four and a half out of five stars on Amazon. However, it is also on my website. My website is Experience to Win. That's experience, the number two, win.com. So I can also be found on any social media platform at Experience to Win. So that's Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, at Experience, the number two, W-I-N. So go ahead, grab your copy. Guys, you need to get mind blown at Experience to Win. That's the number two, W-I-N, uh, dot com. We Absolutely. have enjoyed you. Um, love to have you back. You know, yes. I, yeah. I mean, th- this hour just flies by. So we love to have you back. But thank you so much for joining us today. And we thank you for joining us. And we ask that you join us next Saturday, right here, same chat channel, same chat time, right here on Dr. to Doctor in the chat room on 94.7 FM. We will see you then.